Hi everyone, my name is Trin Vu, and I'm an ID pharmacist at Emory University Hospital Midtown in Atlanta, Georgia. Today, I will be reviewing pertinent drug information for texagibumab, sagabumab, or Evoshield. Evoshield is a combination of two monoclonal antibodies, texagibumab and sagabumab. Both are SARS-CoV-2 spike protein-directed attachment inhibitors. They simultaneously bind to the receptor binding domains of SARS-CoV-2 to prevent interactions with host cell receptors, thus preventing viral attachment. Their mechanisms of actions are displayed in the diagram. Evoshield is currently an investigational drug with several ongoing phase three studies. The recommended dosing is 300 milligrams of tixagibumab and 300 milligrams of sagabumab. This is an update from the previously recommended dose of 150 milligrams of each component. We'll discuss more later in the presentation on this dosing update. Each medication is available as 150 milligrams or 1.5 ml vials. Therefore, two vials of each medication are required to obtain the 300 milligram dose, which are administered as two consecutive intramuscular injections. Patients should be monitored for at least one hour after injection. In vitro data comes from this phase one study, which shows the neutralizing activity of tixagibumab, sagabumab, and evoshield against a reference strain in which all three are able to achieve 100% neutralization. This slide shows full changes in neutralization potencies against different variants of concerns compared to the reference strains referred in the previous slide. Based on the data from this study and other studies, so Gabamab and Evoshield both retained potent neutralizing activity against all four variants as depicted by the white and black circles falling in the green boxes indicating full change of less than three. Tixagibumab, on the other hand, has reduced potency against these variants. In vivo, Evoshield was prophylactically administered to rhesus macaque three days prior to SARS-CoV-2 infection. In vivo, Evoshield was prophylactically administered to Prophylactic Evoshield was also tested in Stenomalgus macaque. Again, Evoshield was administered three days prior to infection. Prophylactic Evoshield administration demonstrated dose-dependent reduction of infectious virus titers in BAL samples compared to isotype control antibody. The 4 mg per kilogram dose, which is comparable to the human 300 mg dose, was fully protective against infection. Tixagibumab and sagabumab have similar PK profiles and notable extended half-lives of over 80 days. The half-life data is based on the 150 milligram doses of tixagibumab and sagabumab. Renal impairment is not expected to impact the PK of tixagibumab and sagabumab, and the effect of hepatic impairment on the PK of these two agents is unknown. AstraZeneca enhanced some of the PK parameters of tixagibumab and sagabumab through amino acid substitutions to extend their duration of action to provide months of protection following a single dose and reduce FC receptor binding to minimize the risk of antibody-dependent enhancement of disease, which is a phenomenon in which virus-specific antibodies promote rather than inhibit infection or disease. Adverse drug reaction data comes from three ongoing studies. Most of the data we have comes from the Provent study, which shows similar rates of headache and fatigue between Evoshield and placebo. However, there were high rates of serious cardiac adverse events seen in subjects on Evoshield. In Storm Chaser, there were actually higher rates of adverse reactions in the placebo group with no serious cardiac adverse events reported. And in Tackle, we also saw higher rates of adverse reactions in the placebo group, with three serious cardiac adverse events in the Evoshield group and one in the placebo group. Data from Provent and Storm Chaser were based on 150 milligram doses. 
Further looking at these cardiovascular events, we see that all patients who developed these events had cardiac risk factors and or histories of cardiovascular disease. The most commonly reported events were MI, cardiac failure, and arrhythmia. Storm Chaser had no cardiac events reported, but patients in the study were younger with less patients with cardiac risk factors compared to Provent. And all patients in Tackle who developed cardiac events also had cardiac risk factors. This data has led to the warning and precaution for cardiovascular events for Evelshield. For cardiovascular events, providers should consider the risks and benefits prior to initiating Evelshield in individuals at high risk for developing cardiovascular events. Other warnings and precautions include hypersensitivity, including anaphylaxis, and clinically significant bleeding disorders in patients with thrombocytopenia or any coagulation disorders since Evelshield is administered intramuscularly. For use in pregnancy, there is insufficient data to evaluate the risk of major birth defects, miscarriage, or adverse maternal and fetal outcomes. IgG1 antibodies are known to cross the placental barrier. Therefore, tixagibumab and sogevimab have the potential to be transferred to the fetus, but benefit or risk to the fetus is unknown. Evoshield should only be used if the potential benefit outweighs the potential risk for the mother and the fetus. There is no available data on lactation, and for use in pediatrics, Evoshield is not authorized for use in individuals under 12 years of age or weighing less than 40 kilograms, as safety and effectiveness have not been studied. For drug-drug interactions, tixagibumab and sagavimab are not metabolized by cytochrome P450 enzymes, and therefore drug interactions are unlikely. Evoshield may reduce immune response to the COVID-19 vaccine, and thus the FDA recommends that Evoshield should be administered two weeks after COVID-19 vaccination. Efficacy data for Evoshield comes from the Provent study, which is a phase three randomized double blind placebo controlled trial, which is still ongoing. The study was sponsored by AstraZeneca and was conducted at 87 sites in five countries. The treatment arm was a single IM dose of Evoshield, which was 150 milligrams of tisagibimab and 150 milligrams of sagabimab versus placebo. And the primary analysis was the efficacy of a single IM dose of Evoshield compared to placebo for prevention of COVID-19. The study included patients over 18 years of age who are immunocompromised and or at increased risk for inadequate COVID-19 vaccine response or have increased risk for SARS-CoV-2 infection as determined by the investigator. Notable exclusions include patients with a history of COVID-19 infection, have detectable antibody, or are pregnant or breastfeeding. Initially, the study excluded patients who had received the COVID-19 vaccine, but during the study, as the vaccines became locally available, participants could choose to be unblinded and receive the vaccine. Data for baseline characteristics were combined across the Evoshield and placebo arms, which included over 5,000 subjects. The median age was 57, even split between males and females, and majority were white. 87% had baseline comorbidities, which included obesity, diabetes, cardiovascular disease, and a history of cancer. Primary analysis was conducted, which only included events that occurred before unblinding or vaccination, and the medium follow-up was 83 days. PCR confirmed symptomatic COVID-19 infection was reported for eight participants in the Evoshield arm and 17 participants in the placebo arm, representing a 77% reduction in the incidence of infection in the Evoshield arm. A post hoc analysis after a median follow-up period of 6.5 months showed a similar relative risk reduction for symptomatic COVID-19 infection in the Evoshield arm as seen in the Kaplan-Meier curve. In this analysis, subjects who were unblinded or vaccinated prior to an event were censored at the time of unblinding or vaccination. There was no additional data provided on how many of these unblinded or vaccinated subjects there were and which arms they belonged to, and so the true protective effects of Evoshield may not actually extend up to six months, but based on the presenting data, the takeaway from this study is that one dose of Evoshield may be effective for six months for pre-exposure prevention in certain individuals. The results of the Provent study led to an emergency use authorization, which was announced on December 8, 2021. The FDA granted EUA for Evoshield for pre-exposure prophylaxis of COVID-19 in adults and ad adolescents at least 12 years of age and at least 40 kilograms who are not currently infected with nor had recent exposure to a person with SARS-CoV-2 and have moderate to severe immune compromise due to a medical condition or immunosuppressive medications 
and may not mount an adequate immune response to COVID-19 vaccination or are unable to receive any COVID-19 vaccines due to a history of severe adverse reaction to a COVID-19 vaccine. The approved dosing was 150 milligrams of tixagivimab and 150 milligrams of sagavimab. It's important to note that Evoshield is not authorized for treatment or post-exposure prophylaxis. Pre-exposure prophylaxis with Evoshield is not a substitute for COVID-19 vaccination. Now, it's important to note that data from the Provence study were available before the prevalence of Omicron. According to the CDC COVID data tracker, the Omicron subvariants depicted in different shades of purple in this diagram here have been predominant in the U.S. since January. And this is about one month after the EUA announcement. On February 24, 2022, two months after the initial EUA announcement, the FDA revised the Evoshield dosing from 150 milligrams of tixagivimab and sagavimab to 300 milligrams of tixagivimab and sagavimab. The recommendation to double the dose was due to concerns that the originally authorized dose may not be able to prevent infection by the Omicron subvariant and provide the duration of protection shown in the initial clinical trial. The FDA tested the neutralizing activity of tisagivimab, sagavimab, and Evoshield against three Omicron subvariants. Virus-like particles, or VLPs, pseudotyped with the SARS-CoV-2 spike Omicron BA1 or BA1.1, showed reduced susceptibility to tisagivimab and to sagavimab. VLPs pseudotyped with Omicron BA2 showed reduced susceptibility to tisagivimab but not to sagavimab. The neutralizing activity of Evoshield was tested against pseudotyped VLPs and authentic SARS-CoV-2 variant strains of the Omicron variants. Evoshield neutralizing activity was reduced in BA1 and BA1.1, but showed minimal change with BA2. Torret and colleagues also tested neutralizing activity of tisagivimab, sagavimab, and Evoshield against a reference strain, the Delta variant, and the Omicron subvariants BA1 and BA2. So Gavimab alone retains activity against BA2, but has some reduced activity against BA1 with a fold change of 49.2. Evoshield does exhibit restored potency against BA1 and is still effective against BA2 with a fold change of only 2.7. Tixagivimab alone appears to be ineffective against the Omicron subvariants in this study. From this study, we can conclude that Sogavimab exhibits greater activity against BA2 compared to BA1. Evoshield retains potency against BA1 and BA2, and in vivo experiments are needed to determine whether the combination of sagavimab and tixagivimab is still relevant compared to sagavimab alone. Case and colleagues also tested the neutralizing activity of Evoshield against Omicron subvariants and a reference strain. In this study, authentic live virus data from Washington University School of Medicine demonstrated that Evoshield retains potent neutralizing activity against Omicron BA2 subvariant with a fold change of 5.4 and retains some activity against Omicron BA1 and BA1.1 as seen in the graph and highlighted in the red box. This study also had the first in vivo data evaluating Evoshield of efficacy against the Omicron variants. A 10 mg per kilogram dose of Evoshield was administered to mice one day prior to infection. The diagrams on the right show viral RNA in lungs and nasal turbinates of mice against Omicron variants and reference strains. Evoshield, which are displayed as green circles, differentially reduce viral burdens in the lungs of mice against the reference strain D614G, BA1, BA1.1, and BA2 variants compared to control. Protection in the upper respiratory tract was less consistent, as Evoshield treatment lowered viral RNA levels in the nasal washes of um, D614G and BA1 infected mice, but not in BA1.1 or BA.2 infected mice. This study also evaluated cytokine and chemokine protein expression levels in lungs of mice via heat maps. The blue indicates reduction in expression, and red indicates increase in expression. Expression levels were compared against isotype control and Evo showed for different Omicron variants and reference strains. All infected mice receiving isotype control had increased expression levels of several pro-inflammatory cytokines and chemokines across all three Omicron variants. 
Mice treated with Ebelschild and infected with BA1 or BA2 but not BA1.1 showed reduced levels of pro-inflammatory cytokines and chemokines, which is consistent with effects on viral burden from the previous slide. In conclusion from this study, neutralizing potency of Ebelschild is reduced against BA1.1 compared to BA1 and BA2 strains. And despite losses of neutralization potency against BA1, BA1.1, and BA2 strains in vitro, Ebelschild still reduced viral burden and pro-inflammatory cytokine levels in the lungs of mice. Data from the previous studies that we looked at tells us that the clinical significance of reduced neutralizing activity in vitro against the Omicron variants remains to be determined. However, until we have more in vivo data available, the updated dosing of Ebelschild is now 300 mg of tisagibumab and 300 mg of sagibumab due to reduced neutralizing activity in vitro. Guidance is provided for patients who have already received the originally approved 100, 150 mg of mab and sagabamab. If the original dose was received less than three months ago, patients should receive a dose of 150 mg of tixagibumab and 150 mg of sagabamab. If the original dose was received over three months ago, then patients should receive a dose of 300 mg of tixagibumab and 300 mg of sagabamab. The NIH COVID-19 treatment guidelines also recommend Evoshield for use as prophylaxis for individuals with the same criteria listed under, under the FDA EUA. The NIH also reiterates that Evoshield is not a substitute for COVID-19 vaccination and should not be used in unvaccinated individuals for whom COVID-19 vaccination is recommended and who are anticipated to have an adequate response. The NIH guidelines were last updated on February 1st, 2022, and so the recommended dose on their website is still the 150 milligram doses. The guidelines list out moderate to severe immunocompromising conditions, which are also very similar to the ones listed in the FDA fact sheet. There are two other ongoing clinical trials testing Evoshield's potential other roles for COVID-19 management. First, the Storm Chaser study is evaluating Evoshield as post-exposure prophylaxis. But the primary efficacy analysis showed that Evoshield did not demonstrate benefit in preventing symptomatic COVID-19 as post-exposure prophylaxis. And the TACL study is evaluating the efficacy of Evoshield for outpatient treatment of mild to moderate COVID-19. Primary efficacy analysis showed that Evoshield reduced the risk of developing severe COVID-19 or death by 50% compared to placebo and by 67% if administered within five days of symptom onset. These are ongoing studies with prelim data, but there may be potential other uses for Evoshield as more results get published. The NIH also has recommendations on how to prioritize Evoshield for PrEP in the events of limited and extremely limited supply. I won't go into much details here, but just wanted to point out the availability of this resource and that it's on the NIH website. In summary, Evoshield is indicated for pre-exposure prophylaxis for individuals who are immunocompromised and may have an adequate immune response to COVID-19 vaccination. In the primary analysis of PROVENT, Evoshield recipients saw 77% reduced risk of developing COVID-19 compared to placebo, but the study was conducted prior to the emergence of Omicron. The FDA updated their Evoshield EUA dose to 600 mg due to decreased neutralization activity against the Omicron subvariants, and more data is needed to determine the clinical significance of reduced neutralizing activity in vitro against the Omicron subvariants. This concludes my presentation on Evoshield. Thank you for taking your time to view this presentation. If you have any questions or comments, please feel free to email or tweet to me. Thank you so much and have a great day.